we're going to be uh, largely in the uh, Old Testament uh, this morning, um, and uh, be largely in the New Testament next week. So with with the same sort of theme. This is a part one and a part twoer. So if you miss part two, God's blessing on you. But you know. <laughs> At least it'll be online. So scripture this morning, uh, we'll start out in number 17, just a couple of uh, verses. And um, it says, uh, number 17, verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, put back the staff of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign for the rebels, that you may make an end of their grumblings against me, lest they die. Thus did Moses, as the Lord commanded him, so he did. And the people of Israel said to Moses, Behold, we perish, we are undone, we are all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Are we all to perish? And then from 1 Samuel chapter 12, it says, Is it not wheat harvest today? I call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord in asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we may not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And this week and next, we're going to be looking at a a form of biblical leadership, uh, and and more specifically, who is and who ought to occupy the role of leadership. And next week, we'll have a bit of an Independence Day twist to it. I can't believe that Independence Day is right on top of us already. But the good thing about that is, and you know that I'm a former, what's, what's the word? I've, I've been saved out of meteorology. <laughs> that, that this means that the snow season is coming up pretty soon. Isn't that great? And, and it, forces, it forces my wife to roll her eyes and go, no. And I'm going, yes, no more insects. But anyway, Independence Day is coming up, and so with the leadership idea here and who should be our leader, uh, it, look for it. Next week we'll have an Independence Day twist to it and be largely in the, uh, the New Testament because the person who occupies the role of leadership needs to recognize that he or she serves God, our King. They don't serve themselves. And the, we're in the uh, book of Numbers here starting out this morning, and um, in, in thinking about the book of Numbers as we're, as we're going through it, uh, it, the story from Exodus to Deuteronomy kind of mirrors the life of a believer because we're saved out of the bondage that we're in. And there's rejoicing in that. And then we get out into the wilderness of, what do we do now? You know, I've come to know the Lord, but now what is life supposed to be like? What are we supposed to be doing? We travel through that wilderness. And then we complain every once in a while to God and say, God, you're not showing me what I'm supposed to be doing. God, Bad things are still happening. I thought that wasn't supposed to be happening after I became a believer. And then, and then we repent for doing that. And then we complain again, and then we repent again. And then we come to Moses, and, and we, we say, wait a minute, if I'm, if I'm holy because now I'm saved, and other believers are, are saved, that must mean they're holy, so why, I don't need Moses, I don't need any of the rules and regulations that are found in the scriptures, even though Jesus says, if you love me, do my commandments. Like, love our neighbor? Ooh, 
Anybody have tingles go down their spine in Sunday school this morning going, ooh, I have to love a neighbor? I don't even know my neighbors. We talked about that. Live here for 20 years. I don't know who my neighbors are. But our neighbors are all over the place. Anyway, and then, and then suddenly we realize that we really do need to follow Jesus. And then we repent again. But that's, that's kind of the story from the Exodus up into Deuteronomy, and it just repeats itself. And that's why we need to study the Scriptures over and over again so we see where we're doing the same things. So the book of Numbers tells us about Israel wandering in the wilderness, and they came through that wilderness after leaving Egypt. And as a result of the lack of faith that God would actually bring them into the Promised Land, they have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And we also saw last week in the letter to the Hebrews, the encouragement to persecuted uh, Jewish believers to hang in there and not fall away. That Jesus already paid the price of redemption to get believers into the real promised land, the new Jerusalem. And that we need to persevere to the end and it all turns out okay no matter what life is like here today. And at the end of Numbers, we find that all of the events that we read about in the book were to shape and mold the people. The events that happen to us are to mold and shape us. And each one of us goes through a, some unique stuff in our lives that help us to fully recognize that God is our King 24-7 for all time. And He never sleeps, He never slumbers. And we go through some really good stuff, and we go through some rough patches, but it's all to shape and mold us and point us to the king. In the passage from 1 Samuel that we're going to be taking a look at, we're going to see that the children of Israel are struggling with this issue of who is king. Um, the, the children of Israel are having trouble persevering solely on the covenant made with Abraham and what we call the Mosaic Covenant, they're struggling to see God as king and Moses as his prophet or spokesperson on earth. And in 1 Samuel, we see the same thing rising up, and we still struggle with this issue. We have far too many Jewish people today who don't see God as king, and we still have far too many people who say that they follow Jesus, yet don't see him as king. They only say we follow Jesus, but Where's that kingship? Where, where are we elevating him to the kingship that he has? I mean, if you thought that uh, you were in the presence of God the Father and Jesus uh, Christ, uh, and you were in full recognition of his kingship, and he was in the room with you, every room that you go, wherever you go, in the car, would you act differently? Would you have different thoughts knowing that God knows every thought? You need to think of him as your king. Wouldn't you be in absolute awe of him? We act much like in uh, Numbers uh, chapter 16. This is a story about Korah um, and Ibram and Dathan um, and we act much like they do. That's why we're looking at it this morning. Well, we don't all act like that. Laura doesn't act like that, I know. My wife doesn't act like that. And I need to say that because she's driving today. And, and what Cora and Abram and Dathan said as I don't see God, I don't feel God. God must not be here. And sure, God wants us to act a certain way and do certain things, but he's not here. So maybe what we think and uh, he wants us to do just doesn't matter. We act as if God exists in an alternate reality when in fact we exist in his reality. In number 16, we find the rebellion of Korah. Uh, he is a cousin of Moses who feels that the Levites got the short end of the deal because they're not the priests. They're not the closest ones to the tent of meeting. 
And, and so they got the short end of the deal. It's Moses' fault that that happened. And he makes a couple of valid or semi-valid arguments in uh, chapter 16 of Numbers. Uh, first of all, Korah asserts that all the people of Israel are priests, and especially the Levites, and they should be able to participate in the priestly responsibilities of Aaron and his sons. In verse 3, it says, They assembled against Moses and Aaron. They said to him, you've gone too far. All the community is holy, all of them, and Adonai is with them. Then why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of God? And he's, he's partially right. Korah's rebellion comes right after the instructions about the sezits or the, the tassels. Um, one of Korah's assertions is that all of the community is holy and Adonai is with them. And that's true in the sense of the, the, the uh, children of Israel are chosen or separated unto service to God. So in that way they're holy. And in the passage about the seceds or the tassels in chapter 15, right before chapter 16, literally right before that, verse 39 it says, it will be your own seceed or tassel. So whenever you look at them, you will remember to do all of the commandments of the Lord and not go spying out after your own hearts and your own eyes, prostituting yourselves. This way you will remember and obey all of my commandments, and you will be holy to your God. Korah, I don't think, was thinking about was that the tassels are to remind the children of Israel to obey all of the commandments, and then you will be holy to your God. Wearing the tassels don't make you holy. Doing God's teachings, that is, being obedient to Him and doing what God says to do and listening to the Holy Spirit and showing forth the fruit of the Spirit, that shows that you are separated from this world to Him. Part of the Sunday school lesson today, you know, going out and being in the community. I'm wearing the seats right now, the tassels. That doesn't make me holy. What makes me holy is being separated to God and having put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ. The things that we have to remind us of God don't make us holy. So they're assuming, uh, we have to assume that you know Jesus is your personal Savior. That's what makes you holy. So Korah is making the case that uh, all Israel is being completely separated unto God, and that's what holiness is, certainly. Yet in the minds and actions of the children of Israel, they're still not trusting God. They're not quite, they're, they're separated to him by him, but they're not separating themselves from the world and being cleaving, cleaving to him. At Mount Sinai, they said, we will do and we will obey, but their actions say otherwise. They complain a lot about God. And they don't fully put their trust in Him. Kor's other somewhat valid complaint is because of the unbelief of the ten or twelve spies, uh, ten of the twelve spies, I should say. Uh, because of them, uh, the children of Israel are going to be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and that's Moses' fault. That's the assertion that Korah made. And we didn't cover this last week, but in chapter 13, verse 1, it says that the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send some men on your behalf to investigate the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. Each man uh, you are to send will be a prince of the tribe of his fathers, a man from each tribe. And the, the, the Hebrew sense of sending some men and is send some men if you want to. Moses didn't have to because the promise was already there. But he chose to send some men and he chose some men uh, that were uh, a prince of the tribe and these, tri these princes were elected by the tribes to be in their office. So the, the men that went were people who were elected by their tribe, and then they were chosen by Moses to go and, and be the spies. But Moses didn't have to do that. 
He didn't have to send the man. So it turns out that uh, uh, in a very real sense, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness was on Moses' shoulder. He picked the spies out and he sent them, even though he didn't have to do that. And, and one of the leadership ideas that comes out of this is that uh, the, the folks that people elect aren't sometimes the best people. Just putting that out there. God knows who the best are. And then the blatantly false accusation leveled by uh, Korah is that Moses and Aaron are the ones who exalted themselves over the assembly of the Lord. In chapter 16, verse 3, that's what is said. That's a perception. The reality is, is that God chose Moses, and Moses did not choose Moses. Moses tried really, really hard to get out of it. And then in verse 8, and what's one of the wonderful things about Scripture is that it just lays it out there. Um, there are very few goody-goody two-shoes in Scriptures. It shows the, the ugly that comes out. And the war of words heats up, and Moses says to Korah in chapter 16, verse 8, Listen now, you sons of Levi. You want to go, listen now, you sons of Levi. Isn't it enough that God, the God of Israel has set you apart from the community of Israel to bring you near to him and to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the community to minister to him? The sons of Levi already had a significant role ministering very near to the tent of meeting, but they had very different functions from the priests. And yes, the priests did the heavy lifting within the tabernacle grounds, and the Levites were more or less assistants working on the periphery. Still, it was an important role, and one that was appointed by God, and in a lot closer proximity than the rest of the children of Israel who were in the outlying areas. Yet, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. The work of the Levites didn't seem as glamorous as that of the priests. Surely anyone could do the work of the priests. All you're doing is taking some offerings and deciding according to the law giving to Moses, do you, do you keep this portion? Do you chop it up? Uh, do you burn it? Do you not burn it? You keep the menorah lit, burn some incense, and we're good to go. Don't need much of an instruction manual for that. In verse 16, it says, So Moses said to Korah, You and your whole following are going to appear before Adonai, you and Aaron, tomorrow. Each man will take a censer, and you're to put incense into them, 250 censers total. And you're to present it before the Lord, and uh, you and Aaron, each presenting a censer. So each man took his censer and put fire and incense into it and stood with Moses and Aaron at the entrance of the tent of the meeting. And do you think that they were thinking back to that first day of the tent of the meeting opening up and two of Aaron's sons got toasted? Apparently not. Because then Adonai appears. He tells the people to separate themselves from the other instigators who happened to be the Reubenites, uh, uh, Dathan and Abraham, they were from the tribe of Reuben, hence calling them the Reubenites. I, I know that sounds like ruminants, but they weren't cows. Um, and, and they didn't eat Reuben sandwiches, I don't think. But the, the, the Dathan and Abraham, they were from the tribe of Reuben, and they were caught up in this thing with Korah in this rebellion. And Moses says, if God does something new, like open up the ground and swallow them, then everyone will know that God did it. And what happened? God did it. The ground opened up and swallowed them, their families, and their possessions. Right after that, fire from God consumed 250 men of Korah, who were at the tent of meeting, consuming the men and their incense, because only the sons of Aaron can present incense to God. They forgot to read the fine print. God showed his power and his sovereignty. 
Korah, unfortunately, wasn't interested in perhaps widening the role of the Levites and having a conversation about that, how the Levites could possibly serve more, which is a possible conversation that could have been had. He was interested in having control. He was mad at Moses having control, but he actually wanted control. Korah wasn't interested in having a discussion with Moses. He was in it to win, not in it to serve. He wanted to be the leader. That's the bottom line. Datham and Abraham, they were not interested in being servants either, servant leaders. They weren't interested in being leaders at all. As a matter of fact, they weren't even interested in serving. Uh, twice they said, when Moses said, come here, they said, no, we will not come. They had no interest in going up and potentially taking over Moses' leadership like Korah does. All Ibrahim and Dathan wanted to do was tear into Moses, and yet it, it wasn't about Moses. It was about God, because God was working through Moses. In chapter 16, verse 30, Moses cuts to the chase when he says about the rebelling Reubenites, when they go down alive into Sheol, then you will know that these men have despised the Lord. They didn't like Moses and Aaron. They were upset that they didn't enter Canaan. And now they're upset because God says they're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And the bottom line is that unbelief and unwillingness to follow God and do what God says to do is despising God. That seems harsh. That seems to be too black and white. Can't we have a little bit of a gray area here? I'm not ready to do what you want me to do. I'm not ready to do it. I don't want to do it. But when we don't want to do what God says we need to do, we're despising God. As much as we'd love to think so, God doesn't offer us citizenship in a democracy. He cannot be shaped and molded into the image that we want him to be. He is king of the universe and all that is in it and all that you can imagine that to be. And he offers us entrance into the kingdom of God where that kingdom is ruled by who? Not a trick question. It's ruled by God. And and as believers, we're, we ought to be thinking that we're already in the kingdom. We're just existing in this world, and we're making an influence on this world, uh, hopefully crying out that the kingdom of God is coming. Come, come, participate with us, and come to the table, and, and be part of the kingdom of God. And that means that we need to be ruled by God. If we're, we're citizens of that. You'd think that the earth swallowing up people and fire consuming the elected princes from each tribe would be enough to prove Moses' leadership, but it wasn't because the next day, guess what? All the people show up at Moses' door and, and, and they say this, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, oh, they, they complain. They complained about it. After they complained about it, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, get away from among this assembly so that I may immediately consume them. So they fell on their faces. That's Moses and Aaron. And then Moses said to Aaron, take a censer, put uh, put into it the fire from the altar and put in incense. Uh, Get going and hurry to the assembly and make atonement for them because wrath has come out from God, and the plague has started. And Moses makes intercession for the people seeking to save lives. And that's quite the opposite of what he did with Korah and with the Reubenites, you know, saying, God, don't listen to them. Don't take their offering. Now he's back to the same old Moses that he was, uh, making intercession for the people. And that's quite the opposite of what he had been doing the day before, So Aaron runs out in the middle of the people with a censer of incense, uh, the prayers, the offering from that. But by that time, 14,700 were already dead from the plague. 
But the intercession of Aaron and Moses stopped God's anger from wiping out everybody. Plus, I think it was a test to see if Moses um, and Aaron had gotten over the fact that the people the day before were raising, rising up and rebelling against them and that these people had just done the same thing. Moses and Aaron were having a bad couple of days. And you can see that they didn't hold a grudge because they made intercession for them. And that's what leaders should do. So you would think that the ground opening up, holy fire from God and the plague would be enough to jolt the people into seeing the sovereignty of God as our king. Yet it doesn't. These, these books are written, the scrolls at that time, were written so that you would have the remembrance of these events. And then we get to 1 Samuel chapter 12, and they still don't get it. The children of Israel see the other nations have kings. Now they want a human king. They want to be like the other nations who had tall, good-looking kings. So they wound up getting Saul. And in frustration, Samuel unleashes on the children of Israel. Samuel recounts all of the things that God has done for them in the past. And in verse 12, says, But when you saw Nahash, king of the Ammonites, marching against you, you said, uh, you said to me, no, but a king must reign over us, even though Adonai, your king, your, your God is your king. You, you think a human being can be a better leader, a better king than God. Samuel isn't happy. You get the sense of that when you read that passage. And so Samuel says, uh, the people have done evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord will send rain at the start of the wheat harvest. And verse 17 of uh, chapter 12 says this, Is it not wheat harvest season today? I will call to Adonai, the, the call unto the Lord, that he will send thunder and rain. Then you will know and you will see your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. And it rained and it thundered. And all the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to the Lord your God, that we would not die. For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. That would be a great, okay. Pretty soon the campaign signs will be coming up, right? And somebody next to you will have all these campaign signs. And you could have a sign in your front yard that says, my God is king, don't blame me, and have an arrow pointing over to the, to the other person. When, when was the last time you heard anyone quote 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 19? We have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. It's not in our vocabulary list. It's not in, in our memory verses to even think that sort of thing. But God created us. He breathed life into us. And even today, relatively few people see him as king and fewer yet experience him as king. And you and I are somewhere on the spectrum between having an evil heart of disbelief and fully recognizing him as king. I know this because the book of, or the books of Moses or what's called the Torah and the writings the Psalms and the other histories and the prophets and the New Testament explicitly tell us how to be on the right path. And so we have this book to read to show us how to be on the right path. And so I know, therefore, you're somewhere on that spectrum and I don't know where, only your heart knows. But we need to seek to learn the wisdom of God and to apply it in our lives. The Bible needs to be read and studied. We need to pray and seek God's guidance. And believers today, we, we see God at work and we need to comprehend in everything that we see that God is at work. We're living in a generation where there are plenty of Korahs and Dathans and Abrahams who despise God. And God is looking for us to recognize that these are the birth pains of the Messiah coming back. As trouble increases, God's people need to do what Moses did. We need to humble ourselves and ask God to intercede. As trouble increases, God will be exalted more and more.
And we need to point out when we see him at work so that they exalt God. We can't fight abortion and trafficking and corruption and government and high divorce rates, you name what it is, without crying out to God. When this nation, when the world sees that there is only one sovereign God, the God of Israel who created all things, then the hearts of people will change and the world will be a better place. It won't be a perfect place, but it'll be a better place. You can stop a riot by having everybody in a riot come to faith. That's the easiest way to do it. Here's the good news for believers who have been trusting in human leadership more than God. Samuel tells the people in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20, Fear not. Indeed, you have done all this evil, yet you do not turn aside from following the Lord, but worship the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn aside to go after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, or deliver for they are futile. Only fear the Lord and worship Him in truth with all your heart, considering how magnificently He has dealt with you. And then here's the warning at the end. But if you persist in acting wickedly, you will be swept away, both you and your king. So the call to action is to follow God. Worship God with all your heart. Worship Him in truth. Consider how magnificently He has dealt with you and even in the last six hours, he has dealt with you in magnificent ways. And let him know that. I'm waiting for the return of Jesus, waiting for him to rule and reign on earth, waiting for him to open the gates of the new Jerusalem, and I hope you are too. The eyes of all nations need to open up so that they can see God for who he truly is. His kingship has become veiled because we don't show it through enough. It's up to the faithful remnant of believers to unveil the King of uh, Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. The time has come to proclaim the kingdom in such a way that people are going to see the living God through us, reflected in us. And it's pretty straightforward. Believers need to live like he is king, because he is our king. He was king, he is king, and forevermore 